I recently made a video showing an ozone generator with a particularly violent power supply. It was sounded terrible, really coarse, sharp and spiky. It wasn't as smooth as I was expecting it to be. And I saw this big sort of comm mode suppression choke. I wonder if that's to try and stop the noise getting back. And the radio hams will be delighted to know, yes, it's a big comm mode suppression choke to stop the noise getting back. And the radio hams will also be absolutely horrified when they see the circuit diagram because they'll know that this probably won't do that much. And it's a pretty cheap and nasty circuit. So first problem I had here... This was originally in a case roughly about that size, plastic case. It turned out to be, as you may see from the back of this, there's a texture on it, quite a shiny, crystally texture. It turned out to be fiber, fiberglass loaded uh, plastic. It was quite nasty uh, to split apart. Very brittle, but I'm guessing that's the flame returnancy. This section, which houses the transformer, is potted in resin, but you can actually sit old tide mark where I actually managed to get down to the grinder, where it's not just resin, it's presumably fire retarding, retarded resin, resin, but it's also got lots of tiny quartz chips to pack it up, which also is fire retardant. Um, the resin that they drizzled over the circuitry had been aimed, they'd targeted, they hadn't potted the whole thing, they'd carefully drizzled over all the key components and uh, they drizzled over the most of the text, uh, fortunately some of it came off in the text and these, it doesn't really matter, I took them out and measured them anyway, but things like the, uh, what it turned out to be a thyristor, they'd carefully drizzled it all over the, the front so you couldn't read it. And this did not dissolve in my usual technique of dunking it in acetone. I had to, I dunked it in acetone. The one good thing that did happen is it did sort of cause the resin not to dissolve, but to delaminate. The one thing that did come off quite easily was the covers of the capacitors, but uh, that left them intact. Uh, the one that did, I'd managed to uncover the value, even when it was all peeling off and cracking, it did measure correctly. And this one, which I kind of guessed the value, given that it was had a similar voltage rating, but a slightly bigger size, um, this also measured out. So let me show you the circuit diagram. I'll shove that out the way at the moment. Don't hold your breath, it's not exciting. Here's your glossy picture. It's not a terribly exciting glossy picture. Uh, what's the best way? I'll put this picture up the other way, if that's the best bet. Uh, it looks a bit out of focus because focusing on this is quite hard because the bits that I really wanted were the components down here. If you can't read them easily, it's because I flipped this image just to make it easier to reverse engineer. So this is your first reverse engineering image. Um, so if you want to take a snapshot of that, feel free. And then I'll show you the other side, which is the track side which was uh, very clear once I'd got most of the resin off. There were anti-tracking slots all filled with resin, which kind of defeats the point in a way. Uh, but this is the other side of it, uh, if you want to take a snapshot of that. And let's reverse engineer it. Well, I've already reverse engineered it. The circuitry is vile, but you know, it's very simple. It's very rem reminiscent of these tiny little ionizer modules, but scaled up dramatically it is not efficient. So it starts off with this comm mode suppression choke, and this time, well, I'll draw it as a toroidal one, even though it's not a uh, toroidal. And this time I'll try and get the description correct. I got chastised last time because I got it slightly wrong. Let's see if I can get it right this time. So theoretically, if uh, mains is coming in and say this is going, uh, the current's flowing this way, it's going through the circuitry and it's coming back out that way. Uh, these are wound so that it creates a sympathetic rotation of the fields in the magnetic coil, in the toroid core. In this case, it's uh, this big chunky core. It's a monster. It's a beast. They must have, it must have broken their accountant's heart when they said, we have to include this or we can't sell it in the UK or America or wherever. Uh, I'm, surprised they, I'm surprised they included it. I don't think, you know, maybe it helps limit the current. I'm not really sure as well, but you'll see from the circuitry. Anyway, if noise comes back out the way, RF noise, but it's common mode, then it will try to go through these things in the same direction and then it will create uh, opposing magnetic fields and that actually makes it quite hard, it actually makes this uh, seem much more inductive and it imposes the actual the noise going out the way or indeed in the way, but it doesn't really matter there. There is, almost alluding to a capacitive dropper, let me zoom down this, this, this is better. Almost alluding, let's actually focus on it, that'd be quite nice as well. 
Almost alluding to capacitor dropper, there's this big fat 1.5 microfarad 400 volt capacitor on the input. And that kind of limits the current, which is just as well because the the secondary, the, well, the output side of this full bridge rectifier, which is based on discrete diodes, that's it there. They're all together in a nice clump of four diodes. Uh, 1N4, hold on, 1N4007. S. The S simply meaning that uh, it's got a smaller uh, lead size. Instead of about 0.8 millimeter diameter, it's about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. It's done for cheapness and ease of just putting it into the circuit board because the traditional 1N4007 diodes have quite a thick lead. Uh, there's also another 1N4007 diode here. I thought it was something more exciting, but it's not. It's just a diode. So you get bridge rectifier. Uh, and then it comes through, and then effectively that gets shorted by this thyristor, which is just going to make quite a current. That's where this in this uh, com mode suppressor choke will actually act just like an ordinary choke. It may help limit the current. But on each half wave, the current coming through gets rectified, and it goes through the primary of this transformer. I'll tell you more about this transformer afterwards. Um, but this transformer here is a standard ferrite uh, rod type transformer, very common style, very easy to make. That's what everything here is cheap and easy to make. It goes through the primary and it charges this capacitor, which is this one microfarad, 105. That's one zero and five zero picofarad adds up to uh, one microfarad or 1000 nanofarad, 400 volt. It charges that up, but there's also a, this tiny little capacitor that was just tacked over the back of the circuit board for some reason. It's a, it's quite an important little capacitor. I think it was just for the space that they could put it in. They stuck it in the back. It's the bit that's actually partially embedded into that resin I had earlier. There's the, there's the case of that capacitor. Uh, but this uh, capacitor charges up via a one meg ohm resistor, which is still buried under there, but I've measured it. And that is in parallel with a diode, the, the other... 1N4007S diode. And on each half wave, the, uh, the sine wave is being full wave, wave rectified. That capacitor charges up, and at some point in that, uh, it's going to turn this thyristor on, and then it's going to clamp. And when it does clamp, it doesn't just... Uh, the main thing it's wanting to do is this capacitor is charged through the coil, but it suddenly clamps, and it shorts, it f forms a short circuit here, and it shunts all the current in that capacitor, through that coil, and creates a massive magnetic pulse into the primary winding of this transformer. It will also, depending where it is in the sine wave, short the power supply via this capacitor. It will create quite a quite a high current uh, pulse in there as well. The thyristor, which is what it is, stays on until it pretty much reaches a zero crossing point, until current uh, reaches a very low level. And when it turns off, well, it actually, it shunts that down. Effectively, it's shunting the rails here. And when the uh, it drops to a very low voltage level that it cuts it off, this uh, diode then effectively discharges the capacitor and it's ready for the cycle again. It's horrible. The thyristor is a TP4M, very reminiscent of the TIC106D, which is now obsolete. Maybe this is just the standard replacement. They had covered the number. It took a careful scraping to get access to the number. It's a very standard component, though. It's probably being stressed because the impedance of this winding, well, the resistance of this winding is pretty low. So what that uh, thyristor is seeing is a series of really sharp, on every single sine wave, it's seeing a sharp spike as it discharges that. And that's also echoed by the output of these to the uh, the ozone generating tube was just horrific. The coil inside this, I did take an angle grinder to it because I wanted to see what was inside. I wondered, are there any more secrets in here? Not really. Uh, the cats turned up. I would have gone a lot deeper, but uh, the cats decided to turn up for the angle grinder party. And then suddenly I decided this is a bad idea, angle grinding in the vicinity of animals. So I kind of stopped. Also, when I got down to the quartz, it was obvious it was just quartz at that point, uh, which is reminiscent of the fart transformers, the neon transformers that are made in Italy. 
that are basically a resin-filled of quartz. And suddenly that makes me realize why they do it. It does offer a certain element of strength, but it is a good fire retardant packer because if you've set fire to quartz, you're doing pretty well. Uh, so that will be a fairly expensive fire retarding resin, but the quartz allows them to use a lot less. And the leads, I ground down enough to find the leads. There's nothing else in this void. This is just space in here. It's just wasted area. They could have actually made it a lot smaller. But that is where they've run the leads in uh, and then terminated them into this. So the transformer itself is consists of this. It has the inner ferrite rod. A round ferrite rod. Let's draw their end round like that. That looks better. And they've got the primary winding here, which is fairly thick wires, and it's very low resistance. Uh, I'm not sure if they get a sleeve under that. Let's just pretend they've got a sleeve. Uh, so we've got one wire coming in, and it's uh, looping around that, and it's fairly coarse winding because it's just going to be a high current pulse. And then over that, they slide a tubular former, which looks like this. It's got uh, five sections and a sleeve so that it can slide over and it insulates it from everything. And each of these sections, you can see the individual sections here, uh, they have lots of very fine windings. I think I measured it about 600 ohms. And the reason they've got it in multiple sections is that it's putting out several thousand volts. And by keeping it in separate sections with a plastic spacer between them, say this is 1 kV and that's 1 kV, it makes it a lot easier to avoid flashover. Although if there was flashover and it's not desirable, it is all fairly flame retardant. The plastic was the fiberglass loaded. This is the quartz loaded resin. It's all, it's all planning for going in fire. Uh, so that uh, then they've got those multiple windings all wired in series, and then the thick silicon insulated cables come in. And maybe part of the reason they've got this distance here is just purely for strain relief and also for separation, so it can't spark out the end. But they've got those cables coming in and then terminating onto the those high voltage uh, windings. And it, when it gets to, in case you missed the last video, when it gets to the uh, quartz tube here, the quartz, well, uh, glass it might be quartz, but the, the ozone tube, what we've got in here, we've got uh, the, an outer conductive layer, which is effectively connect that transformer and will effectively capacitively couple to the inner. So this could actually give a, a zap, this could give a shock. But um, what we have here is it for, it's got a tube, uh, a conductive layer, and then it's got an outer layer that insulates that made of glass, and then it's got an air pad space to the metal tube. And because there's a high voltage between these, but there's a dielectric, it's called dielectric barrier discharge, uh, you end up with a situation that that electrode and that electrode, they want to arc across, but there is an insulator in between. So instead you get a corona discharge, a tiny little spark, millions, billions, trillions of tiny little sparks occur, creating a purple glow. And as the air passes through, it's of high enough uh, energy in that corona that it splits the double oxygen uh, molecules O2 apart into uh, randomly into individual oxygen mo molecules and they sometimes recombine as three oxygen atoms uh, which then makes a, a molecule of ozone which is what they want the sterilizing gas but it does make me wonder is there an advantage to using this circuitry in the corona discharge versus and I've not made a video about this yet Fish friend. Let's just crack that. Enemy. Because really, people put these in the fish tank. And this is a UVC tube. It's actually designed for going into the filter. People are putting these in their fish tanks, thinking it's going to keep the water clean. And the fish then get fried by UVC energy. That's not good. Let me show you this. So this is basically... I'll plug it in. Let's see what the power is. The last one was about uh, 30 watts, I think, but was it 30? No, it might have been 16, but that was a series of sharp electrical spikes. Let's bring the hoppy up and plug this in. So here's the hoppy meter. Let's plug it in. And plug this in, noting that this is a quartz tube with the inner quartz tube, so this will be putting out UVC, so I won't leave it on too long. So it's actually the basic one to fluorescent tube. This is drawing 8 watts per factor point four, which I'd expect. Uh, let's unplug that. I'm getting that burnt organic smell that you get from 
uh, a UVC tube, but not the ozone smell. But it makes me wonder if they used now the tube inside is a quartz tube that, that they make the thing out. It's also it's called things like UVL glass. It's a spit quartz is a UVL glass. It's a glass that is very pure. It it, it can uh, emit much uh, shorter wavelengths than ordinary glass would. If this was ordinary glass, nothing would come out other than just the visible light. But it makes me wonder if they, the standard uh, UVC producing quartz uh, discharge in mercury has two prominent wavelengths. It's uh, 254 nanometer and 184 nanometer. And the 184 nanometer is the one that produces the ozone, but sometimes they dope the glass so that it stops that wavelength coming out. So you just get the 254 nanometer, which is the stuff that kills all the bacteria in the water. And it does. It's very effective. But it makes me wonder, so you've got the two layers of glass here. This is effectively just a fluorescent tube without the end caps inside this and a little uh, electronic ballast here. But what if they use the UVC tube with a ordinary glass outer sleeve and then they pass the air between them? Would that produce as much ozone? How, which is most efficient, the corona discharge in here or UVC uh, exposure to that? And also with this, you could also see when it was still working, although having said that, you can hear this one, although it would just make as bad a noise if it was just arcing over inside instead of creating the, the, the corona. But it makes me wonder uh, which is actually more efficient. I'll have to look that up online and see if I can find any information on that. But uh, as it is, it's, uh, I'll show you the circuit. You can note the circuit. Uh, you've probably seen the circuit. If you want it, take a picture of it, emulate it. It's interesting. Uh, other things worthy of note. On the circuit board, if I just zoom up here, They've covered themselves for the capacitors. They've got lots of capacitor pads. So they've allowed for lots of different pin pitches for the capacitor in this. I'm guessing maybe there would they have chosen a smaller suppression? I don't think they actually give a toss. I think they just throw, threw that in as a token gesture. Uh, but there we go. It's interesting. It's more or less what I expected, uh, which is undesirable. But uh, that's just how they did it. And, well, it was an interesting circuit. It was certainly well worth reverse engineering. It took a while to reverse engineer just purely because they had the resin all over it and clearly they didn't want this reverse engineered. So, ha, 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 up yours, it's done. Uh, and this one, maybe I'll uh, make a video about this one next. Or, well, not maybe not next because I've been doing too many ozone and UVC videos recently. But in the near future... But there we go. Interesting. Well worth taking apart.